Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this week's Crop Diagnostic School Q&A session. Uh, as always, I am Marla Rickman, the uh, unfortunately named fearless leader of our group for this year. Uh, and with me again, we have Ann Kirk, our cereal specialist, Dave Kaminsky, our pathologist, field crop pathologist, John Hurd, our soil fertility specialist, Dennis Lang, our pulse specialist, we have Kim Brown, our weed specialist, and I think John G will be joining us this morning yet too, um, our insect specialist, uh, and uh, Dane is away on vacation this week, and so we don't have Dane with us, but someone will cover that topic area if anyone has questions. So, oh, there is John G. Good morning, John. Uh, so, as usual, we're going to have you post questions in either the question tab or the chat box. Um, and if you would like, you can also raise your hand to be unmuted and we can unmute you so you can ask your question verbally as well. To get going as we're thinking about questions and stuff that you want to ask the group. Uh, John Hurd, I actually have something I wanted to ask you about because this morning as I was logging in, I got the little email pop up from Manitoba Cooperator, um, the daily email that has, you know, stories that they've been talking about. And one of the stories that had popped up today was regarding nodulation in peas. And uh, they were talking about how there's been very poor nodulation in peas, likely due to the poor growing conditions that we've been experiencing. And people were asking questions around, you know, should I be doing any rescue treatments um, for nitrogen on peas because of poor nodulation? I don't know if you have any comments or things to say about that. Um, you know, I don't know how widespread that issue is. I'm not sure where their intel is coming from. I'm suspicious it came from listening to us talk about it because I've spoken to other pea growers who are not looking at this issue. But it is something that we recommend in regular scouting is that check for nodulation. Uh, there's a number of reasons why poor nodulation could result. I go right back to the beginning of the year in dry seed beds, that's just a harsher condition if you're using like an, an on seed peat or, or liquid or something. Uh, that's under these conditions is when the granular you would suspect has some better longevity. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, Dennis and myself and several of the uh, post grower agronomists, uh, uh, we kind of sat down and we uh, produced a little bit of a guideline similar to what we had for soybeans that. Uh, uh, you know, if we're not seeing nodulation by a certain point, I guess our, our trigger was maybe flowering, that uh, a nitrogen application may be warranted. I don't know if anyone has done that. Uh, the, the caveat with that is you still need moisture to take that nitrogen into the soil. And that's the real kicker right now is that uh, we can apply nutrients to the field but without water to take them into the root zone. Uh, they can remain stranded. So it still comes with risk. But but I, I want to kick this over to De Dennis to see if he's heard of any uh, uh, further uh, reports of poor nodulation and whether anyone is uh, doing any applications. Oh, thanks, John. Um, yeah, I've had this question asked by a couple of different agronomists. Um, in a lot of cases, there have been some nodules. Uh, uh, they're finding it, but they're very, very poor. Um, we've kind of run through the scenarios with a few different agronomists and I, I think there's going to be a little bit of trial work done but the problem is as john said if we don't get rain it's really a, a pointless exercise um now we're probably past the stage now where you know once we're into full pot already we're probably past the stage where anybody would really want to go into the crop anyways that's always a challenge with when you're trying to broadcast uh, a urea product onto a uh, pea crop is that you just can't get through the crop as easily as you could soybeans, for example. So, so I think there's a little bit of experimentation this year, but like I say, there's been lots of stress this year with the drier conditions that we've seen and nodulation maybe isn't as good as what it has been in previous years. And, you know, even the height of the pea crop isn't as, as tall as what it has been in previous years. So uh, a little experimentation done, but nothing, nothing widespread at this point that we've seen. So. Well, keeping on that theme then, John heard of um, like nutrient deficiencies and things that we're seeing in crops. Uh, you know, it is pretty dry, but we're hearing a lot of reports of crop of uh, agronomists calling in with regards to nutrient deficiencies. 
um, potassium deficiency, things like that. What's going on? Are you know are we seeing uh, a lot of these deficiencies? Are they true deficiencies? But given the dry conditions, you know, is there anything we can do about these deficiencies? What do we need to know about these deficiencies and how to even diagnose them right now? Okay, uh, good comment, Marla, because I I uh, am often getting right now copies of tissue reports or soil reports coming from agronomists that are seeing, you know, anomalies in the field. Uh, I guess the first thing is that uh, to have a pretty good knowledge or awareness of what visual deficiencies look like. And, and you and I saw one come in last week, uh, potassium deficiency uh, uh, on corn or other crops tend to be bottom leaves and firing on the outside of the leaf margins. I think the picture you and I saw was just yellowing on the leaf margins. So that's an early sign uh, of pot potash deficiency uh, that, that will only get worse Nutrient uptake is, is is much impaired under dry conditions. Uh, you got to remember that a lot of the nutrients, like nitrogen in particular, nitrogen, sulfur, are taken up by mass flow. That's the movement of water uh, to roots as roots dry the soil or grow into that. And those nutrients are along for the ride. Uh, looked at something from North Dakota and they say under real dry years, nitrogen is a third less efficient that they've applied simply because it's kind of lacking some of that transport. And, and the other nutrients that move by diffusion, again, diffusion means they don't move through air spaces, they move through the water films that, are, that surround the soil particles in the soil. So they also are uh, encumbered by very dry conditions. So that's why I'm suggesting that if agronomists are, are taking some tissue tests, that probably good to follow up with the, the paired soil test, because you may find that the, the plant may be lacking, but the soil is quite adequate. And that's a case that, that what's the problem is either some type of root injury. Sometimes we think of uh, bugs or chemical injury or things, but this year it may simply be uh, those dry conditions. And, and, and one, one other point before you, you move to some something more important here uh, is that we've had a few come in, people trying to look to diagnose iron deficiency with the tissue test. We've seen this in uh, con, uh, soybeans and strawberries. And they say, well, the, the tissue test came back high in iron. We have to remember that our soils are, iron is, is the highest, uh, 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 element in our soils. There's there's tons and tons per acre. And uh, the tissue test doesn't measure available iron, it measures all iron. And so if there's any soil or even dust on leaves, uh, it, it can uh, taint that test. And so it, it's fairly non-reliable. Uh, that's where I would suggest people, you know, you, you, you put together uh, your knowledge of the soil, but also your visual symptoms, and don't don't rely entirely on the tissue test to identify your iron deficiencies. Uh, I don't know if you had any comments on that, Marla, because you dealt with one of these calls last week. I yeah, think. I dealt with a call while you were on vacation last week um, about uh, iron deficiency chlorosis in strawberries, and uh, seeing some of that where you know the strawberries were being grown on high pH soils with high uh, calcium carbonate equivalent. Uh, so high CCE on our free lime content uh, in the soil. And so again, the crop, whatever the stresses are of the crop, the roots just aren't active and working the way that they normally should. They're not able to acidify the root zone the way that they need to in order to mobilize that iron or make it available for uptake. Um, while I still have you, I got a question texted in and I am curious to see what your comments are going to be about this, John, because um, a former colleague, a colleague of ours uh, t texted in and said, uh, had some questions about this article in the in the Western Producer, SAP analysis shines when making fertilizer decisions. Uh, so SAP analysis uh, for making decisions on fertilizer application, go. Well, SAP analysis? Yeah. Oh, okay, like uh, uh, squeezing the juice out of the petioles or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'd say well-established for 
uh, crops like potatoes, some good benchmark values. In fact, that's often what we recommend is the nitrate sap analysis, uh, much less so for other crops. And uh, in fact, it's very dependent sometimes if it's for nitrogen on the time of day that sampling is done, uh, the uh, sap becomes concentrated later in the day as plants dry out in the morning, uh, as, as plants kind of replenish or, or re-drink overnight or re-satisfy themselves, then the, they would tend to be more dilute. So that, that sap analysis is kind of hard to interpret. Uh, I got to be honest, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of backyard chemistry or do it your own chemistry. I like to leave it to the experts. I know you have to spend some money, send it away, but they're, they're using uh, some standards. And so that's why I generally go that route. But there's nothing to stop people from picking up these uh, backyard kits uh, or things. And, you know, with some new criteria, uh, they may prove effective. And and that's a good point about, you know, standardization of the analysis, standardization, not just of the, the actual like chemical test uh, analysis, but also how you do your sampling for that type of thing, what time of day you're doing your sampling, that type of thing can really alter the tests. And so it's the reason why we stick to what we know because it's, you know, tried, true, tested repeatedly. Um, uh, and so some of these new tests can take a little bit before we have enough kind of understanding of them and actual use of them before you could actually um, use them well, I guess. Uh, Anne, um, hearing some reports of crop injury potentially due to plant growth regulator application, um, what's causing this and is this an expected injury? Sure, so I have heard a couple of um, reports of injury but the injury that i've heard of is uh plant and growth regulars regulators uh, tank mixed with fungicides so um i guess like we definitely uh there's definitely a risk of having some um crop injury or negative effects if uh, plant growth regulators are applied when the plant is under any sort of environmental stress that would could be you know heat stress drought stress uh, frost stress, um, insect stress, any sort of stress that the plant has, that the plant is already experiencing, a plant growth regulator application could um, have negative consequences. Um, the issues that I've heard of are directly referred to MODIS. Um, so on the MODIS label, it does state that um, in some cases, tank mixing MODIS with another product, such as a fungicide, could result in biological effects that could um, results in increased host crop injury. And I think that's what we are seeing. So there actually are no tank mixes specifically on the MODIS label. Um, and they do state that anyone that's applying this product um, and wants to tank mix it should contact Syngenta before uh, mixing any pesticides because they would likely have more information on um, you know, any sort of negative consequences to expect and could probably provide more information on tank mixes that they've tried. But there isn't specifically anything on the label. My other comment about tank mixing with um, plant growth regulators is, in general, the, the, the best um, efficacy would be applied when the plant is just starting stem elongation to when the second node is out. Uh, they're registered for a, a higher period. So most plant growth regulators are registered until the flag leaf, um, until flag leaf emergence. Uh, but you might see decreased um, efficacy of those plant growth regulators and potential for more injury with those later applications. So if someone is tank mixing a fungicide, my guess is that they're applying it kind of at the tail end of when it's registered for. So, and I, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that because you aren't gonna see as many positive effects of the plant growth regulator and there is the potential for more injury. Excellent, thanks Anne. Uh, Dennis, um, so this is a, a maybe not a fun one. Uh, I've heard that SCN, soybean cyst nematode, has been found again in soybeans. And, and what should growers be watching for right now if, uh, if there's a possibility of finding SCN in our soybeans again in Manitoba? Uh, thanks, Marla. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, in September of 2019, uh, there were four confirmed uh, RMs that uh, the uh, uh, Mario Tenuta's group 
had found SCN in, um, you know, through soil analysis. Um, they did not see any above ground symptoms at that time. Um, so that's the initial, initial finding that were released. Now, just recently, uh, as of last week, um, I got a call from an agronomist and uh, it was in the arm of Dr. Duffrin and the, the comment was, I think we have SCN. And my thought is, okay, well, maybe we found, you know, a cyst on the root. So we went out to investigate. Um, I had actually uh, contacted Mary Chinuta as well, and, uh, and the pulse growers, we all you know, were all there. And um, let's just say uh, there were enough cysts on those roots that uh, pretty much anybody could see them. It was, it was very isolated to one part of the field. Um, the rotation itself hasn't been overly bad for soybeans, but it did also include uh, dry beans in that rotation as well. Um, so again, providing another host crop. Um, the reason the agronomists initially saw it was because uh, it, it was along the headline of the field, but the plants exhibited IDC symptoms that didn't seem to really want to grow out of it. And the plants just became stunted and, and eventually they started digging up roots and they saw those cysts uh, on, the, uh, on the roots. And again, the cysts will basically cut off nutrients to the plant. Um, what growers can do uh, if they do suspect something unusual happening in their fields, the first thing you should, is you should do is take a shovel, go out to the area, dig up some roots and, and carefully break up that soil to, to see if there's any cyst there, any cyst pressed, because it's not, it's not, you're not gonna have it in every field. Um, and uh, as far as rotation goes, you know, you wanna stick in that one to three, or, one, or that three to four year rotation to help uh, reduce the potential for a uh, cyst uh, to uh, move. Uh, cysts that do move in soil, and there are um, also uh, resistant varieties um, and um, that you can rotate between. But I guess the biggest thing right now is uh, when we found it in this field, we were quite surprised actually that the levels were that high. So more than likely, as, as far as Mario was saying, is that it's probably had it in this field for a number of years, and now just with the drier conditions and more stress on the crop, it's really starting to show up. So again, just a cautionary note, if you see anything unusual in the field, uh, go dig up some roots, see what you see, and if you have any concerns, give us a call. Oh, hey, yeah, Dan, thanks. Uh, oh, it, it's, it's fun. Yeah, uh, I've been out to a mystery field or two also, so I'm wondering if if that's what I'm seeing. When, when these things, as you say, are starting to show up on the headland, that could be easily confused, like with a herbicide overlap or type of thing. Is that what it's looking for? Is just generally stunted and yellowed plants? Well, that was the first thing that really kind of brought their attention because it, it just didn't seem to want to grow out of it. Like with IDC, or sometimes you get an added stress, you know, too much chemical on, on a crop, eventually it grows out of it within a week. And these things just kept seeing going backwards, going backwards. Um, so again, it was a very, it was a lighter soil, sandy soil. Um, when I walked out there and, you know, I could kind of see the area that, uh, that was kind of affected and, I, and uh, the agronomist said, well, dig anywhere, dig the first plant. And I'm like, whoa, there's like 30 cysts on these roots, very visible. And they're very small compared to a nodule, so, and, and very white. So uh, Mary took them back to his lab and, and uh, they have confirmed that that's what it is in that field. So in this case, you know, what the grower is going to do is um, he's going to limit the traffic in that area, um, kind of do an inventory of, uh, you know, the equipment that's been on that field this year and uh, definitely stay out of it for soybeans in the future. Uh, we might do a little experimenting on that field just to see what levels are in the field, what the, what the egg levels are in that field. Uh, Mary, I talked about doing something like that. Um, but it's just just uh, uh, kind of make that announcement known that uh, it has, it, we have found it in Manitoba again, and we haven't really seen anything since about 2019. And even in 2019, um, they didn't see above ground symptoms. So this is a bit more of a, uh, it brings the point home a lot more, I guess. Uh, uh, Dennis, so, I'm not as young as you and my eyesight's not as good. If I need a lab to pick out these soybean cyst nematode, is there a place I can send soil samples to? Um, well, Mario Tenuta has been doing some of the work. I think for initially if you're doing finding something, but obviously, uh, let's, put, let's put it this way, John. I think um, even some of us who are a little bit uh, more senior uh, and our eyesight isn't as good, when you see that many uh, cysts on the root, it's very visible. It's, it's, it's not hard to see. Yeah, guys like John Gavlosky, he hires young students with good eyesight to do his identification. <laughs> uh, we've got a question that's coming in. That, uh, Mario posted a picture on Twitter 
of a plant with a lot of uh, cysts on it. So anybody who's not familiar with what mm -hmm. they look look like as far as size, um, that's a good place to look. So uh, the questions come in on this theme then. Uh, would you still expect to find the cyst bodies on roots even in a resistant variety? And then the second part of that question is, what is the mechanism of killing the cysts? Um, I guess, could you find on a resistant variety? Um, I, I would say anything's possible. I think at this point, the variety that we saw uh, was did not have any resistant genes to it. Um, there is a listing of uh, the, the various soybean varieties in CMAN12 and what resistant genes they have. Um, there's really no mechanism for really killing the cysts off. Um, I think a lot of it's just rotation and just managing managing the field. Um, the one thought that the grower had in this area uh, was they might uh, see like a perennial ryegrass in these headlands. Um, so that way it'll stay out of cropland for a bit and you're not going to be transferring all that soil from field to field. Um, and uh, so that that part was uh, that was one option that the grower had proposed that they might do in this field. So uh, sticking in a disease topic here, uh, David, this is for you. And I'm going to preface this by saying that this is we're talking about an Ontario location. Um, so looking for your opinion on applying fungicide to sunflowers for white mold or head rot, and is there a product to be recommended? There are now products available, but I'm not sure that they have been widely used, especially in Manitoba. And we've certainly not had the conditions that favor ascospore release, which is the way that uh, sunflower gets infected, either mid stock rot or uh, head rot. Also, I haven't seen many flowers that are uh, open yet, although that's just beginning to happen. Um, so the question came from Ontario. Mm -hmm. And uh, are they further along in development? Not seeing any comment on that yet. Okay, that was a question that came through the chat. Don't have a lot of experience actually myself. <laughs> well, um, while we're on other things that affect uh, crop production, which is what we're here for this, uh, this summer, uh, John Gavlosky, um, this is kind of a two-parter. What stage of small grains are susceptible to potential economic loss from aphids? Um, and what is the economic threshold? So we'll start with that one. Okay, yeah, and we've, we had some um, aphids blow in and uh, get established more in the eastern part of the province and the eastern part of the central region. That seems to be where the heavier populations are uh, in the cereals. Um, regarding staging, the crop is susceptible right up until soft dough. Once you've hit the soft dough stage, then we consider the crop uh, more tolerant to the feeding, and we don't recommend spraying once you've hit soft dough. Now, the, the thing you want to be doing is um, either you can use a sweep net just to see if they're there, but really to determine threshold, you need to do a count and try to uh, gauge how many aphids per stem on average, which is a bit tricky. Um, you, you can take a tray or something out with you and shake some heads and look on the stems and um, see what you can find. Don't get too freaked out if you shake a head and you get 20 aphids. Um, check a few more in the area and don't be looking for heads with aphids to shake out. Randomly pick a head, test it. I uh, had one agronomist call me last week. He was concerned because some of the uh, heads he was finding, 20 or 30, but then he told me, well, that was maybe one in 20 heads that had that many. So in, in his case, he was well below threshold still. Um, so yeah, just make sure you're scouting properly. And there can be edge effects with aphids and cereals. So do move into the field a bit. Well, that covers the threshold and staging part, I believe. Okay, yeah, and then so the next part is, is there a way of factoring in natural enemies such as lady beetles and lace wings, hoverfly larvae, um, things like that into making that management decision um, if we're trying to uh, you know, decide what that threshold is? Yeah, there's a couple of ways you can do this. Now, uh, again, I'll use an example. I talked to an agronomist in the Eastern region. 
they were borderline thresholds. They, they were toying with should or shouldn't they spray. So they were oh, somewhere around um, 10, 12 aphids per stem uh, that they were finding. They did notice though that there was a lot of lady beetles and lace wings in the field in particular. Now there's other things that are good predators too, but those were the two that they said seemed very abundant. They can find them on a lot of the plants. So they decided in that case, we'll just keep an eye on this field and hold off for now because we have seen situations where sometimes the natural enemies get the upper hand and that population stops building plateaus and then drops off. So that's what they were counting on there. The other thing you can try if you want, there is an app called Serial Aphid Manager. And what you do when you do your uh, 20 counts at five areas, you enter the aphids into the app, but you also enter in lady beetles, lace wings, uh, hoverfly larvae on there, damsel bugs, I believe pirate bugs. There's six or seven natural enemies that you key in. And it takes that data and it predicts for you what the count should be in a week given the aphid natural enemy levels and the stage of your crop. So that's something else that's available out there. And it's called Serial Aphid Manager, CAM. Okay, and somebody had also posted that in the question box to me as well. So that's good that you touched on that. There's something else that came in here and I apologize because I may have totally missed because I'm reading too many things at once. Um, and that means I wasn't listening to you 100%, John G. Um, but it says heads are not showing yet, probably two weeks away. Can you name the product available? The tricky part right now is you've got two options. You've got Saigon, which is the Nethoate, and you've got Malathion. Um, both are uh, in short supply. I, I know some people have told me they're having trouble getting the registered products in their region. Now there's a lot of other things that will work on aphids, but those are the only two unfortunately registered for aphids in the Canadian prairies. So yeah, uh, Scout you feels, and certainly if you're well above threshold, you, you need to do something, you need to find a product. Um, but hopefully it won't come to that because uh, some of the products are are in short supply this year. Okay, uh, I got a message here from Dennis. Dennis wants to make an additional comment on SCN. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, thanks, Marla. Um, yeah, just uh, just to encourage growers that if they do see something unusual in the field, go take that shovel and look. Uh, I did the same thing in my soybean field and uh, saw an IDC patch in the kind of the middle of the field, which I kind of thought was kind of related to the solstice based on where it is. But just to really investigate that and just don't assume it's SCN. Um, it, more than likely it probably isn't, um, but you need to really look and see what you see in those areas. I dug my roots up and they were fine, but the plants itself were quite stressed. So um, that's why this disease or this condition, I guess, with uh, soybean system can go unnoticed for a while because everybody thinks it's just something else. Um, but you just really need to go investigate that. So that's all I have. I am glad that you brought that up. Uh, as a soil specialist, I feel like a shovel is your most important tool no matter what. Um, so I'm glad that you're reminding people to get out and dig. And, and when we're dealing with a lot of these um, issues around even some of the nutrient deficiencies and stuff that John, we were talking about at the beginning, a lot of times things are resulting from poor root growth, whatever that is. And so being able to dig up and look at that root and see how that crop is actually growing below ground is a really key uh, key thing. Uh, Kim, um, so question to you about weeds. And I know that we're getting kind of, we're, well, we're very late in the season to be thinking about weed control at this point. But uh, the question is, I have a lot of weeds that are coming in uh, or that I'm seeing in some of my crops that are, you know, at the reproductive stage, they're flowering, um, they're setting seed, you know, can I still control these things? Uh, probably not. There's a few cases where you can come in and kind of do a bit of a burn off, but I know we do have some very late canola fields in the province that are still getting sprayed as long as you're within the safe um, limit on that, depending whether it's a Liberty or, or, um, um, a, clear, uh, or a glyphosate tolerant variety, um, then those ones you still might be able to get away with something. The problem is a lot of the weeds are getting very big, so um, you need to keep your expectations 
realistic on those, but I know we do, there are some canola fields out there that might still be sprayable, but the weeds will be big. Um, in other fields, we're past the safe staging, we're past the, the we have to watch our pre-harvest intervals. There's a case sometimes for bazagran, um, say something like in a soybean field when we've got some canola coming up later on. Um, I have seen that work. Um, it can be sprayed quite late. Um, it doesn't kill the volunteer canola coming up, but it will burn all the leaves off and it kind of makes it a bit more manageable. But really, you don't have a lot of options left. The only other things you can do is if you've got some weeds and you don't want them going to seed is you can go in and do some patch management um, you don't want those seeds hitting the ground, so you'd be wanting to get in there pretty quick. Most of our weeds aren't showy when they flower, so you don't really see the flowers at all, but you do have, to, once you start to see the seeds form, and sometimes even then the seeds are very, very small, um, but once you start to see any kind of reproductive growth, uh, we want to start getting rid of them. So, um, but unfortunately, there just isn't a lot you can do. Uh, the weeds themselves are just most of the time just beyond staging. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of the answer that I was expecting to that question, Kim, so thanks for that. So we are to the end of our half hour, and I thank you again uh, to all of the audience for your participation and sending in your questions. I thank the panel again for all of your thoughtful answers and responses to the questions coming in. Um, a reminder, tomorrow is Crop Talk, so anyone who's registered for Crop Talk uh, the um, agenda tomorrow is an update from some of the WADO projects. Scott Chalmers will be speaking, and then that will be followed by the Crop Talk panel, which is a lot of the friendly faces that you see on screen right now. Um, so there's an additional opportunity to uh, ask questions to all of the panelists tomorrow. So with that, I thank you guys again for your participation, and we will see you next week. Have a great day.